Yeah, but Frank and I go back 19, late 1960s. Uh, the swimmers you're referring to with Carl Roby is I coached Carl in 64. He was already the world record holder as a high school swimmer when I coached him. Uh, Frank and I always say that Carl uh, made seven coaches famous. <laughs> it's true. This is the comment Mark made about the swimmer, that you have to have the swimmer. And the swimmers make coaches at times. Um, Frank was referring to the fact that in 1968, after he, was, he went to law school out of Dick, Dickinson, he suddenly decided he wanted to get swimming again, go for 68. So when he came back, we had him go out to Foxcatcher with Frank. He had long course there all the time, you know, morning, noon, and night. Frank only lived two blocks from the Robies, anyways, for, for years. And so Kyle trained with Frank, and that's why he made the comment uh, about too bad. Because with Carl, with Frank, got the gold medal in Mexico City uh, in 1968 when Spitz was still a high school boy. Um, but it, I want to thank the uh, uh, American Swim Coaches for electing me and or selecting me uh, to be in this. It's real psych uh, for me to be in this Hall of Fame, and it's the first one that I've well, I've, it's a being in the Coaches Hall of Fame is what I've been doing for 56 years. I started in 1960, and I've enjoyed every day. I have an expression to my swimmers, I've never worked a day in my life. And Doc Councilman, now he refers to Doc Councilman, um, that, and you hear the award and his name is, goes in the, uh, forever, and he's famous and everybody talks about it and everybody has their versions. But I'm a person that I feel blessed in my swimming because um, I didn't, I, I was in high school, I was a rower. The Buffalo West Side Rowing Company, Buffalo, New York. And I was a, on a lightweight crew. I was in my high school crew and in the summer on a lightweight crew. Seven days a week from February to Labor Day. No missing practice because you get demoted in hard work and you just never miss practice. And it was seven days a week. And then I come to Cortland. It's a little state teacher's college, Division III. Um, in 1952, my sister went there 11 years before me. That is not the reason I went. I only had two choices, Buffalo State or Cortland State. Uh, luckily, in those days, there was no tuition at state schools. Uh, and my, my folks could send me. And I went up to my mom, and I said, well, now I got two schools to choose from. She said, no, you don't. You got one. You're going away to school, learn how to grow up, and if you don't, you come home and go to school. And I wanted to row, and no rowing at Cortland. They had all the sports. So I got to go out for the swim team because I knew how to swim. I was the best swimmer in the rowing club. Now I go into the pool. It's a 20-yard pool. And I walk in, and they're doing turn, or they're going back and forth. I don't And I said to the coach, I said, what? What are they doing? And he said, well, we're doing turns. And I go, well, I don't know how to turn. Remember, I've never swam on a team in my life. I knew how to swim. I could swim some distance stuff. I grew up in Lake Erie on the Canadian side where, the, where we have a cottage, still in the family. And I said, to, I said, well, I don't know how. And he said, well, get in and go back and forth, and we'll teach you later. Now, the blessing of that is that the man's name was Dr. Jim Councilman. And this was his first coaching job, 1952, Cortland State. You look it up, five years of Cortland State. Uh, and a lot of the Indiana swimmers forget that. They have no recollection of it. Only the early ones in 57, 8, 9, 60, 61, or 2 in that period. And I, he, this is his first coaching job. He had just finished his doctorate at Iowa. But do most, of you people, most of you people don't know where he even got the name. Doc was given his name. And the Indiana swimmers once, at, at, was at his, the, day, the night before his memorial service, they had a big party at the football stadium for about 300, 400 people, swimmers mostly, in the past. And they started telling stories and, oh yeah, who named Doc? Because they had these shirts, Doc Councilman. And I said, I had to get up in front of him and say, Doc Councilman's name came at the Cortland State, it's a big phys ed school, 2,000 students, 400 500 men, 400 of them were phys ed majors. It was a phys ed school. 800 students, men and women, of the whole 2,000 were phys ed, uh, like Springfield. 
in those days. And, it, and the, they had this thing, we want to make people professional. So if you have a doctor, even a PhD, you're referred to as doctor. Well, Doc, being the glib person he was when he taught, and it was entertaining, no one ever cut his class. He's world famous at Cortland for, uh, from t for his teaching. Forget the coaching part, teaching. And, his enter and also the entertainment, the, the, the communication, the, the it factor that he talked about, the, the ability with people. And they, so being as glib as he was, by the time I go out for the swim team, after a couple months of school, his name is Doc. As, as a comment, instead of being doctor councilman, they all, Doc, and they, did what, and they started this Doc routine. And that's where his name came from. Now, do most people know he's a world two, famous World War II person, if the older people who know it. If you watch the old movies and you got these uh, bombers going through and all the ack ack and all that stuff happening, that's him. He was a pilot, 28 missions, got shot down in Palestine, was with the Russians for two weeks, got a distinguished flying cross. He had a record that if it wasn't for his swimming career, that would have been the top of his obituary of being a World War II hero. A man had a million stories. Now, the luck is, I was in. You, you know he's the man that influenced me. I mean, if I start out at 17, never swam a day in my life, and four years later I'm at the Olympic Games, uh, and I set a world record in the prelims, and I blew the finals. <laughs> Choke. <laughs> See, you laugh. That's what I've told people. We weren't laughing then. Uh, but I learned from that. Now, this is something I've taken to coaching. I try to explain to the swimmers, I choke, just, you know, you can choke and whatever, or panic or whatever you do. And, um, and Doc told me then, you're gonna, you're gonna be famous for this someday, which, I mean, how, many, how many people do you know had a world record, and the winner, Murray Rose, one of the greatest, greatest that ever lived, and Murray Rose wins the final in a time slower than your time. Six seconds slower, you look it up. And, wow, I got it. Um, you go, this is the first time I've really told the story that much. Um, he, he, he says to me, he said, George, you'll be famous. And we get on the plane, he says, just think of it. You're going home with the world record and the Olympic record. And so when you looked at books, reference books, Olympic, and then it goes, Murray Rose, Yamanaka, and then Breen, and then a little asterisk, and then underneath it tells you that I, you know, the record in the, in the prelims. Now, I became famous for it, but it became a thing, and that's when Doc talked me into swimming four more years. But, uh, and I had the blast of my life swimming those four years of, of, of the people I met in Indiana. When he went to Indiana after five years, he went, uh, and I went out with him, and he snuck me into grad school with a 2.3 average, I got a graduate assistantship. Yeah, but see, I deal with my swimmers. Uh, they, you know, I'm not one of these, I'm not a 15,000 yards of workout person. And, and yet I was a hard worker in my day. And that's, and when he refers to, Frank refers to my stroke setting Doc back. Well, Doc wasn't a world authority at that time, Frank. He, so he, but the point was that he allowed my, I did have an awkward stroke. And when you talk about these names, Famous names. My Mount Rushmore is Councilman, Haynes, Dalen, Gambrel. Everyone has their own. Um, Dalen, I love Peter because Peter was such a historian, and Doc brought me on the history of swimming. And, he, and Peter would greet me all the time. And, uh, and, and the last time I saw him was at the Hall of Fame dinner a few years ago on a big boat ride they had, uh, I don't know, two, three years ago. And Peter would always greet me with, George Breen, the man, the man with nothing that got the most out of nothing in a swimming career. <laughs> and I had people say to me at times, what, doesn't that insult you? And I go, no, because it's a compliment that I was able to with a, a two-beat kick, one arm big straight, one arm low, and a, and a 42, what I take, 42 strokes of length on a 50-meter pool. <laughs> oh. Because I, I heard at the Olympics, they're talking about this, well, it was 20 or something. Or, and I'm going, 20? Are they only, are they only counting one, double? 
<laughs> Anyways, that's what happened. When I was blowing the 1500 in the, fine, in the prelims now, I wasn't even tired. I wasn't even tired when I finished. I was <laughs> calm and complete. But, it, I, but in two days, the world descended on me, and I, and, and, and I went and panicked. And when it happened, I, was, I did the first two laps, and Doc turns to a man named Red Sylvia, who was Bill Yorzik's host. Bill Yorzik was the Olympic champ in 1960. Red Sylvia's name is kept in history at Springfield. Uh, he, he produced an incredible number of college coaches in the 50s, 60s. And he turns to Red and said, it's over. And Red goes, what are you talking about? I'm going 100. He said he's taken 42 strokes. No, it was 42. He says he's taken 44 strokes of length. And we did stroke count. We did all that stuff except I just took a few more than other people did. <laughs> but, um, so I go into coaching and Doc, uh, well, he, Frank met the, the Riviera Club. Anybody ever seen the Riviera Club? Good, a few people. That's one of the most, it's still there. And it's one, I, I've been so blessed because my first coaching job and the man was up here in the Hall of Fame, John Galvis, I succeeded him. He passed away in December of 1960. I never coached before. I was coaching at a place called Jordan Y part-time. And I inherited a team of 200 swimmers, 16 women going to the nationals and four boys, men. And um, I took over the team, cold turkey, I guess. And, and of course, Doc Councilman, no, having swum for Doc and being an Olympian, it got me started. And there was a man who influenced me named Gene Lee. If some people know him, he's in the Hall of Fame. Gene was at the Indianapolis Athletic Club. I trained with him Monday through Fridays, my last year of swimming with age groupers. I swam next to 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds when I was 25 years old, 24, 24. And I learned from Gene a lot about age group swimming in that winter. You know, I was getting paid a buck an hour as a lifeguard while I was training. We didn't have subsidy in those days. Um, but I had, a, I had a, a, the way people treat, and I learned so much from Gene. And when I, he, when I went to take the job, Gene says, George, you just go in and you act like you know what you're doing. And go in there and don't pay any attention to what John ever, what they swimmers. And so many famous coaches, starting out right from the beginning, I was introduced to all of the old names of Matt Mann, Mike Pepe, Kip, well, Kippeth, I knew very, I got to know him very well because of my swimming. But meeting those people, and when I look at that Hall of Fame, I think I've met everyone there that's living, uh, of the people, and through all the years, the three gentlemen coming in with me tonight in the class, I've known them when we were coaching. We were all coaching club, and, 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 and I've had um, all kinds of conversations with all four of them. I think the greatest thing in coaching is the camaraderie, the feeling, it's such a sport that it gets you, you, you meet the coaches, you know them more personal. And yeah, maybe, well, when John was given this thing about Buddy, I was thinking people say things about Frank and George, and then they'll go, well, there's stories we don't, well, that's all exaggerated. It's not really true. <laughs> See, my table, my table, some good friends are laughing about it, but we've been together for 40-something years, and the reason we took part, and now another thing we did in coaching was took part in the local committees, the national committees and all that, and got into all of these things. And that's something that Doc showed me, and, and Gene Lee, Jack Kelly did it for me, and then people as I came along. And you know, they talk about that it factor today, and, and the people have it, and there's all kinds of, and if you knew some of these people, you wouldn't believe they had it. And two of the greatest people I've ever met, they were probably the two most unusual men that I've been with, and I've been on a trip with one of them, and the other man lived in the Philadelphia area for a long time, and he was Jack Bowerly's coach as an age grouper. But two of the greatest people I've ever met were Styx Balator and Don Sonia. Now, anybody that knows either one of them, they, they got it done. And they had magic with their swimmers. And I've had such fun with this because when you feel that you've done something, as, and maybe it's work, is when you meet the people as you grow up and you get older, and the, and the men and the women uh, write you notes, cards, Christmas cards, whatever, but also attach a thank you note. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have had that. And when you get the thank yous uh, and have people say some compliments to you, you know that you've been doing it the right way. But I've always had fun with it, and that's why uh, I heard a couple people murmur that I'm still coaching five days a week. 
Uh, I think I'm trying to be the oldest coach in swimming. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not though. There's a man in Nebraska I know that's a couple years older. Uh, yeah, I've already checked it out. But I have. I have a blast at this. At this, I've I've loved it all the years going to the ASCA conventions back then, the U.S. Swimming Conventions. I went to my first U.S. Swimming Convention in 1963. I've been the. I was there for 50 years in a row. Um, I, and, and it's, it's such a great thing to meet the people, whether, uh, whether it's the swimmers, whether it's the coaches of all the other teams, and, and you know the kind of sport, you, you talk to them on the deck, you talk to them in the mood. Here you're competing, your swimmers out there competing against them. Imagine two football coaches standing around talking how the game's going, you know. But you do it in swimming. I've had a guy stand next to me and say, well, my girl does this in the end of the swim. And I said, well, my girl, okay, uh, I'm done. Um, my buddy gave me the whistle. That was our deal. <laughs> Serious. Now, I wouldn't say that 30 years ago, but at our age, we, we start saying anything. It's true. Uh, but I, I'm psyched to be in, and, and it's great to see all the coaches. And uh, all I can say is you're in the greatest sport going. Uh, watch that Olympic team, how they swam. Fantastic. Those swims near the end just added to it. Uh, stay in the sport. Have fun with it. Uh, and as I have, and I just hope to keep doing it. Thank you. Uh -huh.